I, um, I'm a Google Maps guy. If I need to know where, I, where I'm gonna go, I use Google Maps. So I'm told uh, by Nate and Court that the younger people say Google Maps is for old people, and, and Apple Maps is the way to go. You gotta have an, a, an iPhone. Uh, but Apple Maps is the way to go. But either way, uh, you're familiar with uh, getting a map on your phone, or maybe some of you still have a, a Garmin, or I don't know, what, I forget what else there was uh, at one time in, that you kept in the car. And you put your destination in there, and it told you how to get there. Now, Sarah will tell you uh, that, that I like maps. I, I used to have an atlas. Uh, I like to know how to get somewhere. I know what's going to be around when we get there. Um, and most of the time, you know, you plug that thing in, you hit start, and it takes you to where you need to go. But Sarah will tell you that from time to time, um, I will say, I don't think that's the best way. <laughs> and I will, go, I will go a different way. And you know how that, you, you, you've done it before, whether it's on purpose or by accident, and then it's like this incessant, like, it used to tell you rerouting, rerouting. I don't, you know, now it tells you to turn around, make the, make the closest U-turn or whatever, and I'm like, for, you know, I, I'm good, I'm on my own, I can make this work. Well, um, you know, that's fine if we're talking about Google Maps or, or Apple Maps and we're, you know, maybe you're gonna drive a few extra miles. Uh, but when it comes to life, when we say, when we look at God's word and say, well, that's, that's fine, but I've got a better way, boy, we end up in a world of hurt, don't we? And uh, we're going to see that this morning from, from Genesis chapter 3. Uh, let me just do a little recap. We're in a series that I've entitled Origins, and we, we've been in Genesis, I think this is maybe maybe the fifth week that we've been in, in Genesis. We started in Genesis chapter one and we talked about God. We talked about the fact uh, that he is eternal. We talked about the fact that his word is powerful. His spoken word created the world. He is the creator of the world and it's God who determines what is good. And we, we looked at that the first Sunday. Then, then, then we looked at uh, from Genesis chapter two, creation. We, we said in the first chapter identifies God is the creator, and, and chapters one and two talk about uh, God creating. He created with a design in mind. He created with intent, and he created with purpose. And we talked about the fact that I believe when you, when you look at Genesis chapter one and you read through it, the best interpretation of this is to say that God created the world in six 24-hour days, and he rested on the seventh. Uh, then, then from Genesis chapter one and two, we, we talked about mankind. It's, it tells us God created them, male and female, he created them. Uh, two sexes, we talked about marriage being a divine institution, not a human idea. Why do, why do we as, as Christians, uh, why, do, why do we seem so rigid when it comes to things about marriage? Well, because this is God's plan from the beginning for mankind, and most importantly, perhaps, Marriage is to be a picture of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And one day there will be a, a marriage feast in heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth. God put Adam and Eve in the garden and it was perfect. And one day we will be in heaven with our Father and it will be perfect. So this, is, uh, this was an important um, thing for us to talk about. We've also been talking about, as we've gone along, the idea of worldview. It is important to know how you view the world. It is important to know that other people don't view the world the same way that you do. So let me just talk about this again for a second. Um, one way that you could uh, explain worldview is your worldview explains reality for you. It's your story about reality. So a biblical worldview um, would say that God was the creator of the world. Every, every, um, every story or most stories have a, a, an introduction or a beginning. There's some sort of predicament that must be overcome and then there's some sort of resolution to that. And so we've kind of been looking at worldview that way and the biblical worldview is that God is the creator. He created this world. He created it with purpose and intent like we've, we've been looking at um, in, in the last few weeks. Um, the, then the, the next question about worldview is, what's the problem? What, what is the issue that needs to be solved? What's the predicament that must be overcome? And then what is the solution? 
solution? How, is, how are we going to fix it? What is the resolution? And so um, we've been talking about the problem in our world is that man rebelled against God, that, that, that create, the created has rebelled against their creator and thus um, making a separation between us. There's our, we had, Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with God. We don't because of the sin in our lives. So how do we resolve this issue? Well, we can't do it on our own, but God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And through uh, belief in him, we have redemption. So there's an origin, there's a predicament, and there's a resolution. And as believers, we know that this initial belief or faith in Jesus is really just the beginning. And we come each week, and maybe you go to Bible studies, and maybe you uh, read your Bible on a daily basis to understand really who God is, and, and how are we to live life in this world in preparation for this eventual eternal solution that God has for us. And so we're here this morning looking into his word, trying to align ourselves with what the Bible teaches, trying to have a biblical worldview because we believe that if we do things God's way, that's the way to abundant life. And so, so far in this series, we've really just been uh, in the the whole origin part of it. And today we get to the predicament. What is the predicament that we all face And the problem is that the created, us humans, we rebel against God, our creator. So let's pray and we're going to look at it this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, we do thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for the truth that is in it. Lord, I pray that as we just look at some of these foundational uh, things that, that really help us to um, uh, just establish some basic things that will help frame how we look at your word every day, uh, that you would uh, just make it true for us, that you would make it real for us, that you would give us understanding, uh, and that we would be able to apply it into our everyday life. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to read a couple of verses to start, uh, Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 15. We've read these verses already, Uh, we're just going to Uh, focus on a different part of these verses this morning as we get started. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 says this, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we talked about this already. Adam was created first. The, the next verses there in, in chapter two uh, describe where, where God said to Adam, look, why don't you name the animals? Adam named them all. There was not a helper suitable for Adam. And so Eve was created. And uh, that kind of rounds out chapter two. So we, we, we've talked about that part, but we really didn't talk about verse 16 and 17. And this is an instru- the instruction or command The Bible says that from God to Adam, where God says, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have you ever wondered why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? You ever wondered that? Have you ever thought if he just hadn't have put that tree in there, we wouldn't be in this mess. Or maybe he could have had the tree in there and it, if it didn't matter whether they ate or not, we wouldn't be in the predicament that we find ourselves in. They never would have sinned. They'd live happily ever after. We wouldn't have any issues in, right? We're, we're kind of fooling ourselves if we think that way. Um, okay, so let's just, let's just remember the setting that Adam and Eve are in. A perfect world in a beautiful garden. All of their needs are met. Uh, it, it, we see in, in, in chapter three that, that it seems like God comes on a regular basis maybe and walks in the cool of the evening with them. Perfect fellowship with their creator. No conflict. Every need taken, taken care of. Literally living in paradise. 
Like we dream of living in paradise. They're literally living in paradise, walking with God, created in the image of God. Essentially, God offered them this, this, this glorious and eternal life. They could have lived in the garden forever if they hadn't eaten from the tree in perfect harmony with each other and with God. God just gave them one boundary. He said, you can have, you have all of this and you can have it forever, perfect fellowship with me. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we could ask, so what's so special about that tree? Was there something in the fruit, you know, that if they ate it, then it, it, it physically changed them somehow? I don't think so. I think that the, the change that Adam and Eve, the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve obtained was, came from this. God said, don't do this, and they did it anyways. They had knowledge of what was good. They were living a good and a perfect and an innocent life. When they ate the fruit, they became aware of evil, and the evil was not something in the fruit itself. The evil was the fact that they had rebelled against their creator and they felt guilt, and they felt shame, and they came to no death. So let's read the account together. Genesis chapter three, uh, starting in verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So this is a a well-known passage of scripture, and and sometimes when you get to the well-known passages, you just kind of breeze right through it, and you say, oh yeah, I know this story, and you just just push on through, and hopefully this morning we'll just slow down um, and and look at this in a little of detail. Um, One thing I want to do as we start, I think it's important to note that other writers of scripture look at Genesis chapter 3 not as an Uh, as a myth, not as an analogy, but as uh, historical truth or historical fact. So just a couple of these, uh, because it's easy to say, um, well, that was just the story. That helps us to give, it gives us understanding, but it didn't really happen. Well, in Luke chapter three, uh, the, the, the writer of the gospel, Luke, gives a genealogy of Jesus. So Luke was writing about a real person in history, Jesus Christ, and he said, this is the lineage of our savior, Jesus. And he starts um, in verse 23, Luke chapter three, says Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli. And it continues down the line through uh, David, through Abraham, through Noah, uh, until we get to verse 38, Luke 3.38 says, and and he's been continuing along, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Luke says, Jesus, this real person that you, you know, that you observe, that you have heard about, he descended from these people going right through to Adam, a real person. Um, And then another one in 1 Timothy 2.13 and 14, we're just just grabbing this verse out of there because he, he mentions Adam and there's, there's a context to all this that we're not looking at this morning. Uh, but Paul writes to Timothy, Adam was formed first, then Eve, which confirms what we've been talking about already in Genesis chapter one and chapter two. And uh, Paul continues in verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Real people, a real historical account, 
uh, really happened in history. So um, there's other passages we're going to look at probably... Um, not next week, but the week after that, that will continue to confirm that, that writers of Scripture look at Adam and Eve in this Genesis account and say, this really happened. It's not just a good story that we can learn something from. So uh, verse 1, now the serpent. If, if you're just reading this for the first time, uh, you, you, there's, some, there's some characters in this story. There's, there's God. He was the creator. He created Adam. He created Eve. He created the animals. He created the birds. Um, he, created the, he created the creatures of the sea, and now all of a sudden he's talking about a specific person. So who, you might ask, who is this serpent? We know Adam, there's Adam, there's Eve, there's God, now there is a serpent. And the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. So at first, it seems like just kind of a neutral s- statement. There is the, the serpent, he was crafty, more crafty than the others, and, and for us, crafty, uh, maybe your verse, your translation says cunning, maybe your translation says shrewd, and, and those words for us have a bit of a negative connotation, which from my understanding, there's not a negative connotation in the Hebrew word here. Uh, so he's, he is, um, uh, he's, got, he's got some wherewithal about him. Um, But in the Hebrew, there's a play on words that uh, I'm just going to bring to light. This is something that I didn't know about, but I've learned about it. Um, And it really pulls out the difference between Adam and Eve and the serpent. If you went back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it's the last verse of Genesis chapter 2. The conclusion is the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And it seems like a bit of a strange conclusion to this, this uh, story that they were in the garden together, they got married. Um, why, why is this added? Well, I think it just really speaks to uh, the innocence of Adam and Eve. They literally had nothing to hide. They had done no wrong. They were, they were pure before God. And so we have uh, Adam and Eve, it's, verse 25 says, they were naked and not ashamed. And verse 1 of chapter 3 says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast. So um, if, if you look at the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for naked is arom. Arom. The Hebrew word for crafty or cunning or shrewd is arum. So Adam and Eve were arom, the serpent was arum. And so one commentator said, Adam and Eve were nude, the serpent was shrewd. So, okay, what's the point? Like, is there, there's no, like, no big revel, revelation coming out of this, but if you are, if you enjoy good literature, the Bible is the best that there is. And this is what, this is, if you're reading it in Hebrew, you would, you would read a contrast between the two immediately, just with the word choice. And, uh, and we, see that, we see it. Adam and Eve were innocent. They had nothing to hide. But the serpent was cunning. He was crafty. He was shrewd. So who is this serpent? Well, it's not, the serpent's not identified in Genesis chapter 3. Just refer to the serpent over and over again. If we read in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 1 says this, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. We're going to see that this serpent certainly is a deceiver. And uh, Revelation identifies this serpent, this deceiver, as Satan and the devil. So the serpent, though, has this question for Eve in verse 1. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So in a courtroom today, this would be considered hearsay, inadmissible evidence. He's asking Adam, or excuse me, he, the serpent is asking Eve, did God say this to Adam? Eve wasn't there. She hadn't been created yet. And the, and the serpent is attempting to put doubt into Eve's mind. So remember what God did say. 
you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. God's instruction is about the bounty and the plenty that's available in the garden. God's saying you can eat from every tree except this one. God's saying look at all of what I have supplied for you that you may eat. And the serpent says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree? Com- seemingly innocent maybe, hey, I'm just trying to clarify, is this what happened? But, but the serpent is focusing on what God withheld. Trying to tell Eve, God is withholding from you. Did God really say you can't eat any of these trees? God's saying, look at what I'm giving you. And the serpent says to Eve, look at what God's withholding from you. And isn't that how the deceiver works today? God sent his son Jesus and says, I have given you new life. You will receive eternal life. By following my plan, you can have grace and peace and joy and love and contentment and satisfaction. And Satan whispers in our ear, the deceiver says, God's withholding from you. He doesn't want you to be happy. He's not doing what's best for you. Do whatever you want to do to make yourself happy and it will be just fine. So Eve's response in verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So Eve is mostly correct in her response, but she adds something that God didn't say. She says, neither shall you touch it. And we can go back and look and see that the prohibition was not to eat from it. God didn't say anything about touching it. So we don't know where Eve came up with this idea that you cannot even touch it. Maybe that's actually what Adam told her. Look, Eve, let's not, we're not even going to touch it. If we touch it, we might eat it, so let's not touch it. Maybe this was something that Eve came up with. We don't know, but we do know that uh, Eve has this idea in her head that there is more, to what, more than just what God said. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, here in the weeks to come, but isn't that what the Pharisees did in the New Testament? They had, they had the, the laws, they had the law of Moses, and they added, and they added, and they added. And originally, their intent was good. If we, if we add some extra laws, then we won't even get close to the ones we're not allowed to break. But it's faulty, it's faulty thinking. We must let God's word say what it says without adding to it or taking away from it. So this, was, this is the serpent's response. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So if we're questioning like, okay, who is this serpent and what is his purpose? What is his goals? We see it now. He's calling God a liar. Maybe the first question was innocent. We know it's, it wasn't. Uh, but at first read, maybe it was trying to create t- uh, doubt in God and in God's goodness. Did God really say? But now he's calling God a liar, essentially. God said, you will surely die. And the serpent says, you won't surely die. God doesn't want you to, your eyes to be opened because then you'll be like him. Then you'll know good and you'll know evil. So here the serpent is again, God's holding something from you. You're not like God, but if you eat this, you will be. God doesn't want you to be like him, so he's withholding from you. But how were Adam and Eve created? They were created in the image of God. They were more like God than any other humans that have walked on this earth. And Satan said to him, God's, God's holding something from you. God doesn't want you to have all that you could have. He's not really benevolent. 
He doesn't really have your good in mind. He's actually selfish. He wants the good things for himself, but he doesn't want you to enjoy the good. Take a bite. You'll see God's got the whole apple pie and he doesn't want to share any of it with you. Now, if we're going to be fair, God was withholding something from them. He didn't want them to have the knowledge of evil. He didn't want them to experience the guilt and the shame and the death that comes from sin. That's what God was keeping from them. Now, Satan's lie is he's keeping all that's good from you. He's keeping the things that you, uh, allow you to enjoy life. And God's saying, no, I'm giving you the things that you can enjoy life with, and I'm trying to keep from you the things that will hurt you and that will harm you and will, keep, and, and will give you death. So verses uh, six and seven, the serpent saying, questioning God's goodness, He's calling God a liar. You're not going to die. You're actually going to become more like God if you eat of the fruit. And what does Adam and Eve do? Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So this is the fall. When when you hear somebody talking about the fall, they're talking about this moment in, in history when Adam and Eve first rebelled against God. I would guess that the other trees in the garden were pleasing to look at and were good for food. But she desired the fruit to make her wise. She wanted, she wanted to know, as the serpent said, what is God withholding from me? What is he keeping from me? What is this knowledge that God has that I don't have? I think we, we should note that uh, it says in verse six that her husband was with her and he ate of it. You know, it's easy to say, oh, it was Eve's fault. They were together. She ate and he ate. Um, we read already in, in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 15, that Adam was put in the garden to work it and to keep it. One person said that he was the, garden, the, the gardener and the guardian of the garden. But he failed to do his job. He, he stood by and allowed Eve to eat and then he ate it with her. Now, have you ever had the question, what were they thinking? They had it all. Probably the same things that you and I think sometimes. God's keeping something from me and I wanna know what it is. All the generous blessings that God's given me is not enough and I want more. He's he's promised me many things. He's given me many things. But I want what I want, and I'm going to get what I want. Just me? Will you guys identify with me in that this morning? Now, as I said, God was keeping something from... He was attempting to keep guilt and shame and death from Adam and Eve. And they, they rejected that. The significance of this event cannot be overstated. Adam and Eve living in perfect harmony with God their creator, and they said, it's not enough, I want more. And the truth of the matter is, we're guilty of it too. Even as followers of Christ, we read his word, We know what is right, we understand what is wrong, his spirit is within us, guiding us, leading us, directing us, and we say, I want more. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53, six says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, 
And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. This is the predicament of the biblical worldview that must be overcome. The created has rebelled against their creator. Eternal life, perfect harmony, perfect fellowship with God has been lost and death has been earned. So the question for us and the question for the biblical worldview is can death be overcome and can eternal life and perfect harmony be restored? That's the epic story of the Bible. This is a good book. So of course the answer is yes. Despite our rebellion against God, he sent his son Jesus to offer us redemption. He lived a perfect life on earth without sin and when we put our faith and trust in him that when he went to the cross and when he died on the cross and he rose from the dead, he was paying for your sin, he was paying for my sin and he overcame death and returned to sit at the right hand of the Father. When we put our faith and trust in him, Scripture teaches that we too will have our fellowship with him restored and we have the promise of eternal life. So we're gonna continue. We've gotta talk more about the the consequences of this first sin and how it has affected all of humanity. We'll get to that, I believe, on the 24th. We've gotta talk more about the redemption. How How does God bring redemption into this story? And it is a good story. And, and I, I want to remind us that it is important that we know what the Bible teaches. It teaches where we came from, it teaches us about the reality of where we are today, and it teaches us about where we are going. And when we interact with people that have a worldview that, that doesn't line up with Scripture, that contradicts it in a variety of ways, knowing what your worldview is trying to gain an understanding of what their worldview is helps in your interaction with different people. It helps you to see, as as Peter uh, encouraged us to do there back in May, it helps us to lead with love and compassion instead of uh, enmity. We're gonna see that this this, uh, sin put enmity between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of Eve. And we don't want enmity in our relationships. We want to, as Peter said, lead with love and compassion so that we could win some to Christ. Why don't you pray with me as we close this morning. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful for the truth that is in it. Boy, we wanna know why our world is messed up today. We're starting to get a glimpse of that this morning where it all started at least, with Adam and Eve. With every opportunity to, to live a, a perfect, harmonious life with you, and they rejected it. And we can understand it because uh, we have an opportunity to read your word, we can understand your word, we can apply your word to our lives, we can live by your word, And yet each one of us chooses to say, you know what, I don't like it. Or I want more, I want something different. I wanna do things my way. And uh, we see this morning um, that that's exactly what Adam and Eve chose. And as we, uh, in the weeks to come, as we get an idea of the consequence of that sin, of the implications of that sin, uh, Lord, we come to understand uh, why we need a savior, why we need Jesus. And, and Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that says, yeah, I identify with Adam and Eve, uh, I choose my own way, but I, I don't know about this redemption. I don't know about this solution uh, to the predicament of sin. Uh, that they would ask somebody, maybe they came with someone, maybe they know someone, maybe they come to the front afterwards to ask a, a pastor or, or an elder about it. But it's just as simple as saying, I'm a sinner and I need someone to deal with this sin problem that I have. And we know your word teaches us that you sent Jesus to do just that, to deal with the sin problem that we have. And I know many in this room have already put their faith and trust in you and yet each one of us tend to go our own way. 
And Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes to the areas in our life uh, where, we, where we say, I know what God's word says, uh, but I don't know that this is such a big deal. I don't know if I really need to bother with, with that level of commitment. I think it's okay if I just do this. And that's, as we see this morning, that's really how it all started for Adam and Eve in the garden. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to the areas in our life where we're uh, choosing to go our own way. Our faith and our trust and our belief is in you. Our salvation is secure, and yet we still want a little bit more. We still want what we want. We want to do it our own way because of pride and selfishness. Lord, help us to see those areas. Lord, convict us this morning that the abundant life comes through being obedient to you in every aspect of our lives. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.